Hello everyone and welcome to another educational video from EGIS Associates. We're going to be continuing our series on the GISP certification and talk about experience points. How do we enter them and how do we calculate them to earn the GISP certification? So as you may remember in the past videos we talked about you need a certain number of points in order to get the GISP certification for the portfolio portion of the application process. So in that, you need the minimum of 30 points in education, which we've already talked about in a previous video, a minimum of 60 points in experience, that's what we'll be talking about in this video, and then eight points in professional contributions, which we'll talk about in a future video. And then lastly, you've got 52 points to point, uh, push between all of those categories so that you achieve a, a, at least 150 points in your portfolio towards earning your GISP certification. Let's take a look at how we calculate experience. So first thing we need to remember is that you've got to have a minimum of four years of full-time equivalency working in GIS. So that means you have to have worked in the field doing GIS full-time for the equivalent of four years. That may mean that you do a some time is part-time and then rest of the time is full-time so it may actually take you longer than four years uh, it may be that you work part-time the whole time so say you work in a job say you're a planner at a city and you only do gis 50 percent of the time you're working in that role which means that it could take you eight years in order to achieve that four-year full-time equivalency so once you've achieved the, the four years and you need to start submitting your experience points in the application for the GISP, how do we do that? Well, what GISCI has done is developed a tiered system. We recognize that GIS is a very diverse field. And to acknowledge that, we know that not every function is created equal, meaning not each thing that we do in GIS requires the same level of technical skill and knowledge to accomplish. And so to illustrate that, when we're calculating experience, we've got to break down what we do into one of three tiers. We have the tier one, which is the GIS analyst system design and programming. You get 25 points per year that you do that full time. So if you don't do all of that stuff full time, then you won't you'll get less than 25 points per year. You'll get a percentage of that. Tier two is data compilation, maintenance, teaching, and you get 15 points per year that you do those type of tasks. And lastly, tier three is just a general GIS user. You get 10 points for that. And that's going to be, you know, using Google Earth to find things, providing technical support, uh, those kind of, of activities. So when you're filling your experience out, you need to be thinking what were you doing in that given position? Because many positions will actually require you to do multiple tasks that are split between multiple tiers. So it's not unusual for you, know, for you to reference multiple tiers with one position with one employer. So what actually makes up these tiers? What, what specific functions do that? Well, if we look at tier one, uh, we can break it down like this. So your database design or, or management is a tier one activity, conducting needs assessments to determine what applications you need, what size database, uh, what users, all of those kind of things uh, would be a tier one activity. Actually developing applications, this could be scripts, mobile apps, web apps, uh, mo using like model builder also would fall into this category because it's again a higher level tier or, or requires higher level skill and knowledge. That is a tier one there. Uh, data acquisition. Now that's not like digitizing on an aerial photo. Data acquisition is actually working to plan uh, the acquisition of aerial photography, right? Setting out the flight lines, filling, figuring out the elevation and the, the required resolutions and those kind of things. That's what we're talking about with data acquisition. So that would be tier one. Performing analysis, so doing buffers, unions, intersects, uh, interpolation of data to generate, say, contours from a DIM or something along those lines. That's tier one. So you get kind of the idea of what kind of task equal tier one. Now we'll take a look at tier two. 
So tier two is really your data compilation, maintenance, and map composition, teaching, so on. So if you're editing data, so you're doing data updates, whether it's parcels, center lines, uh, or whatnot, that's a tier two activity. Data modeling, um, where do you store it in a shape file uh, versus geodatabase versus CAD file. So generating reports, uh, geocoding, all of those are considered tier two. And any sort of training, so whether you're a college professor or you're like uh, our instructors at EGIS Associates that, that teach classes, you know, it doesn't matter what the topic is. It can be about tier one activities, but just teaching and developing those courses, those are going to be tier two. And you may think, well, if I'm teaching, you know, how to build applications, it should be tier one. Well, the, the realistically, we know that instructors and teachers, you build the, the course once and you teach it multiple times. So you're really teaching the same thing over and over again. You're not really actively building apps and things of that nature. Uh, so that's why that's still considered a tier two level activity. Tier three, again, this is basic GIS use. So you're going out to Google Earth and you're plugging in an address to figure out a location and, and that kind of thing. Um, you're maintaining GIS web capability. So that's not the same as um, developing the application. That's things like making the server services are started and, um, you know, if there's patching it to, to run with a new version of Leaflet or whatever those kind of basic capabilities are, migrating apps from one server to another, um, that, that kind of thing. Uh, providing technical support. So if you work in an organization and you have to help others use the GIS software, that's going to be a, a level three. If you're a GIS manager and you're having to attend meetings, maybe you're coordinating with other organizations, you're managing a users group, um, that kind of thing, but it's still related to GIS. So it wouldn't count just going to like meet with the HR department to talk about the new HR policies. That, that doesn't count. But if you are going to the city's GIS users meeting to coordinate activities within the city on developing, say, a new layer, that kind of thing, that would be a tier three activity. So that kind of is how we break down the experience in any given position. So let's take a look at some samples so you can kind of get an idea how this works in the actual portfolio. So here I have an example of a sample GIS technician. Uh, and again, this is just a sample. Everybody is going to be a little different because we all do different things. So you see here the title is GIS technician. The employer is EGIS Associates. Uh, was in that position for a year in location. And then duty. So that's a basic description of what the position entailed. It helps the reviewer because remember, this is being reviewed by a person. And we always have to remember that everybody has different experiences, different perspectives. And so we need to give as much detail as we possibly can to make it easy for the reviewer to understand what we were doing. Because I may have worked in a uh, planning office and I've there's an epidemiologist that does GIS reviewing the application or... Uh, in this case, I worked for a consultant and my uh, application may be being reviewed by somebody that worked primarily in local government. So they're going to be, again, different perspectives on this. So we want to make it as clear as possible. So you can see down here uh, where the duties are. I've explained what I did as a GIS technician. I created various maps pulling from multiple sources, including geodatabase, shapefiles, and CAD drawings using ArcMap. Um, again, the fact that I'm using ArcMap is really not pertinent to the GISP process because it's vendor agnostic. But again, just trying to put things in a frame of reference that people understand. Uh, updated GIS data for clients, again, working for a consultant. So I worked with multiple clients, including parcels, zoning, utilities, streets, political limits. I also geocoded utility customers. Okay, So that's the basic description of my duties as a GIS technician for EGIS Associates. Then you have to add the actual experience. This is that tier one, two, and three breakdown of what you did while you were, in this case, the GIS technician. So luckily here, I did pretty much straight tier two activities uh, while I was there for a year. So I did 100% full time at tier two, and I gave the description. I added data for clients requested, created maps, 
multiple sources, uh, geocoded utility locations. All of that goes back to those breakdown uh, of what tasks were in tier two. And I tried to pull from keywords from those tasks. It really makes it easy to evaluate this position, right? Edit data, created maps, geocode. Again, keywords makes it easy. Yes, this was tier two activities. Very easy for the reviewer to look at. Okay, so here we have a sample of a GIS analyst working for the city of Tripville. And again, we see the duties described as performed a wide range of GIS activities, such as um, creating maps, editing data, performing analysis, creating models and scripts to automate tasks, providing software support. So as we moved up to the analyst level, we see that we're going to be splitting our experience across multiple tiers. So we've got this is a little bit more complicated, right? So in this case, by going through the duties here, we can see we have tier one, tier two, and tier three activities outlined. So we got to put those in. So you can see I took my tier three, that was the software support, uh, put that in, and I estimated that I was doing that 20% of the time I was a GIS analyst for Tripville. Now, this is really subject, you have to kind of figure out what you did. Typically, GIS CI is going to take you at your word because you do have to sign and agree to the code of ethics and rules of conduct when you do that. So, you know, as long as it makes sense and seems to fit, they're going to take you at your word. So just be cognizant of that as you're putting that. So next was tier two activities. So I spent about 40% of my time while I was a GIS analyst doing tier two activities. That was editing data, creating maps, uh, assisting the technicians with geocoding, performing basic spatial uh, and attribute queries to extract data for analysis. And then lastly, you can see the tier one activities. Again, I estimated this was 40% of my time. So I did those things such as performing analysis. Uh, and I listed some of the analysis I did, crime, growth, and fire protection, right? Created multiple Python scripts and models to help uh, automate repetitive tasks and even deployed and developed several web applications there. So again, estimating that was 40% of my time. Now, as you put this in, you can see it's calculating the points per year I, I'm getting for that. So uh, as you can see, any position, it doesn't have to be a GIS analyst, but any position you may have multiple tiers. You may have just two, you may have all three tiers, uh, or you may have a single one. It just really depends on what you did. And you just have to make sure that reviewer as they're reading this really gets a good idea of what it was you were doing. Let's take a look at an intern because a lot of times we'll start out our careers not working full time in GIS. And even maybe later in our career, we're not doing full time GIS activities. The last two, the, the technician, the analyst, we had 100% full time equivalency. This time as an intern, we're only doing about half time. And we can see that. Worked part time as an intern at the, the college, working as in campus engineering and public works office, average 20 hours a week performing various GIS tasks. So you're working, instead of 40 hours, you're working 50% of a 40 hour week. That's why our full time equivalency shown here is only 50%. Okay. So even when you work part time, right, you can still count it. So even as an intern, I'm going to count this experience. So as an intern at the University of Tripville, working in the campus engineering and public works office, I provided software support and apparently 10% of the time I was there, I spent doing that. Uh, then the remaining time 40%. I spent creating maps for presentations and present or for meetings and presentations, converting data, editing GIS layers, and so on. So that only totals up to 50% of full-time equivalency. Okay. So it is possible in a position to not have 100% FTE or that percent of full-time. Okay. So don't discount any job you may have had where you only work part-time and, and maybe it was less than 50%. You can do that. It just has to be the, the experience you had while doing GIS that you count in there. Okay. And then lastly, let's take a quick look at uh, a supervisor position, a manager. In this case, this is me as the CEO of EGIS Associates. Uh, started that in 2010 to present. You can see my script. Uh, 
uh, duties there. Oversee overall corporate operations, conduct marketing sales activity, manage multiple GIS related projects, develop and teach training classes, and so on. Okay, so as a supervisor and manager, I'm certainly not going to have a 100% full time equivalency for this position because you know, I'm running a company, so I'm dealing with marketing, HR issues, contracts, uh, proposal writing, going to other meetings not related to GIS, and so on. Generally speaking, if you're a supervisor, a coordinator, a manager, a department head, whatever your title is that's in that managerial role, uh, especially at this high of the spectrum, we're not going to expect you to have 100% FTE. If you do have 100% FTE and you have a title of GIS supervisor, GIS manager, GIS coordinator, department head, um, we're going to look at that very closely because it's very hard to imagine that you would be at that level and be 100% FTE or dedicated to GIS activities. Now, the obvious exception of that is you have that title, but you're a one person shop. We get that. If that's the case, make sure you let us know that in the duties description there, uh, just so we know that then that would explain that we can, okay, we can accept that because it's probably meaning you're working way more than 40 hours a week, but you know, you get the idea. So as the CEO of EGIS, I'm spending 15% of my time doing tier one activities. So that's create and evaluate Python scripts, uh, conduct needs assessments and provide implementation plans for clients so on. So definitely tier one, tier two, GIS technician. So yes, I develop GIS classes and I teach them. Not, not a surprise there. I also do on occasion get to edit some GIS databases and produce maps. And I get very excited when I actually get to do that. So you can see how that breaks down. Again, I'm only doing here, uh, was it 40% FTE? So even under 50% there. As a manager and a supervisor, how do you overcome that because we don't want to penalize people that move up in their careers. We want people to move up in the career. So what GICI has done is develop a supervisory bonus. So if you find yourself in a management role in a position, so you're managing a team, you're a department head, so on, whatever, if you're managing people, you're supervising a project, uh, coordinating with others. This is where you can claim the supervisory bonus. You get 10 points per year that you're in that position. Okay, so you're going to put it in, get the supervisory bonus, um, and that would, would help you out. So you can see on my EGIS as the CEO, I've got, or at least at the time I did the screenshot, 54.8 uh, points for my supervisory bonus. That's for being the, the head of EGIS for that many years. Okay, and again, that can also be done on a percentage. So if you only were a supervisor for part of a year, right? You can claim that. Now, the key here is you have to be supervising GIS activities. It doesn't count being the, the technology manager at Best Buy, okay? Or, you know, the shift manager at a warehouse, right? That, although you're supervising, you're not GIS supervising, right? So that, you can't count those. Uh, and of course, you also need a letter from your employer that says that the claims you're making here are indeed correct to the best of their knowledge. Now, you only need the letter from your most current employer. You do not have to go to every employer you've ever had. The concept here, the idea is that your employer, when they hired you, did some sort of background check on you and they can verify that what you're claiming is indeed true. So you don't have to go back. Now, if you are self-employed or a contractor uh, or you're currently unemployed, you can go back. So say you're self-employed, right? You can go to your clients, one of your clients and get them to do a letter as well. Assuming again, that if they hired you to do the job, that they did some background checking to make sure you have the experience you need to do the job. Uh, you can go back to previous employers as well if you're currently unemployed and get a letter from them, assuming, you know, you're actually in talking terms with them. So, you know, there are other ways to, to do that uh, if you run into a bind. 
So let's look at how do we actually enter some of these into our portfolio via the GIS CI website. Okay, so you're going to go to GISCI.org and log into your account like we've showed you in, in previous videos. And then get into your application. So you want you there to enter in your experience. You go up here to experience. Click there. And it's going to take you uh, into the area to add your, your various experience. So first thing you can do is add a employer. So this is who your employer happened to be and you'll fill in the information there. So the employer name, the city, uh, the state, if it's outside the US, what province, uh, then the country, your title, when you started and stopped there, and then a description of duties. So this is, you know, general idea of what you did. And you don't have to write a whole book here. A nice, concise, but descriptive paragraph will work. Once you do that, you'll click Save. Now I'm going to cancel that because I don't want to keep adding right so you can see here I've added you know various employers there's the city of Tripville that we were just looking at university there so once you've added an employer you're going to go into that employer and say the city of Tripville here and I'm going to then go uh, start adding experience so this is where you'll click and then pick the tier and then the duties you perform and fill those out and again, you'll have multiple ones for each of these positions. So uh, say here for the CEO of Trip uh, of EGI Associates, I click Add Experience and say I have a Tier 3 um, Right. So my duties uh, as a Tier 3 was provide software support to clients using ArcGIS software and Google Earth. And then I can say my percentage of that is, say, 5%, right? Again, I'm just estimating that. If I have any sort of documentation I want to provide, I can put in a file to upload that. Don't know what you'd provide there, but if you have something that shows that. Uh, notes that you want people to consider, you can put that in there, and I'm going to click Save. Okay. And so you can see it's added the tier three user right there that I just added to this position. Okay. Now, if you want to enter your um, supervisory bonus, even though you so already have I'm CEO of Tripville, I'm sorry, not Tripville, I keep getting that confused, of EGIS here, I also had to add another EGIS employer here for my supervisory bonus. Okay. So we're going to you know, you go in and, and have to add that secondly and then again the percent of full time and so on. And you can edit that. Uh, also notice for pos different positions at the same company. So EGIS Associates here and there's EGIS Associates there. So you may have to add the same employer multiple times if you perform multiple roles at that employer. So we can do that. And as it's doing, as you're adding these, it's calculating your points. And again, if you go to your primary information, you can see a summary of what you've done. So at uh, EGIS Associates here, I got, this is the CEO we just talked about. There's that. There's my supervisory bonus. It's Keck and Wood. URSA, I don't know what it was, Tier 3. Minus points. I don't know how I had minus points there, but anyway, um, you get the idea as it's adding in those those points, and you can see it here on the GISCI website in your your portfolio login. So there you have it. That's how you uh, calculate your experience points and enter them in for the GISP certification. I hope this has provided you some good useful information and helps clarify how you go through that process. I know that tiered system can be a little bit confusing. I know that's where a lot of folks ask me questions uh, about it. But uh, hopefully, like I said, this will help clear things up for you. So just remember, if you need any help with GIS, whether it's uh, implementing GIS uh, in the enterprise or even on a small scale, you want to figure out how to bring ArcGIS Pro into your organization and what that takes, um, whether you're trying to integrate 
GIS with other solutions, or you, maybe you just need some uh, staffing assistance with maintaining your GIS or performing some analysis or help with a specific project, we can certainly help you with that. And of course, if you need any sort of training and support, whether it's for ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Desktop, ArcGIS Align, ArcGIS Enterprise, uh, even help maybe with AutoCAD or QGIS or some other things, we can certainly help you with those things as well. Just feel free to reach out to us on our website at www.egisassociates.com. You can give us a call at 678-710-9710. Shoot us an email at info at egisassociates.com. Uh, please remember to subscribe to the channel if you like what you see and you want to keep getting updates when we release new content. Uh, also, give the, the video a thumbs up, you know, a like if you found it helpful. Uh, and if you have any questions about this or GISP in general, feel free to leave us a comment. We'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. And if you really want us to keep going, be able to, to make better videos and increase the, the type of content we can provide, please become a patron of our channel. Uh, there's the address, uh, patron www.patreon.com slash EGIS associates. You can go there and, you know, basically make a donation so we can, you know, buy new cameras and or buy equipment to compare. So maybe if, if you want to know something about the quality of certain GPS units, right? Well, we have to buy those. They don't just give them away to, uh, to us for free. So, you know, we're going to use that money that's donated there to, to help us do those kind of activities. So with that, Hope you all have enjoyed it, and I'll see you all in the next video.